This video brought to you by Brilliant. Learn something new every day with 20% off with the link below. That is where my company comes in. It is made from the mutagen that is oozing through your blood. The government will then send a blank check, and I'm gonna be rich. Like, stupid rich. Ooh. 2014's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was an effort from Paramount to essentially repeat the incredible financial success of the Transformers franchise. And on paper, the plan was indeed foolproof. Just take this semi-old property with a bunch of cool elements and put it on the big screen. I mean, it's the Ninja Turtles, it's gonna be awesome. Run! Of course, since we are talking about Paramount here, which at the time was quickly turning into the most incompetent studio in Hollywood, the Ninja Turtles film franchise didn't quite become another Transformers. Instead of generating $5 billion across six movies, the first movie alone was so underwhelming that even though the sequel improved on a lot of things, the franchise was already losing so much money that it was dead and buried right then and there. As always, in cases like this, I'm sure there's an endless number of individual issues that led to this outcome. This movie in general is a long list of very strange creative choices, from casting Megan Fox as April O'Neil and Johnny Knoxville as Leonardo to reshooting and reworking the story to a point where it basically makes way less sense than what you'd expect from a movie about talking Ninja Turtles. You know, not only is everything tied neatly together with a f sledgehammer. This is my father's lab. I've known them since I was a little girl. They were my pets. They were my childhood pets. But the already empty villain is also diluted down into two separate villains to respect Japanese culture. Because yeah, adding in some faceless evil Japanese samurai guy who seeks power for no evident reason is way more respectful. But individual issue aside, what I would propose to be the key reason behind the untimely demise of this movie and the franchise it tried to launch is the way it handles those core elements that make this franchise what it is. As in, those elements are transferred onto the big screen so poorly that their inherent value was immediately ruined, from how they're created to how they're used in constructing scenes to how none of them get treated with dignity. And so today, let's focus on that. Let's look at 2014's Ninja Turtles to see how exactly the value of these franchise elements in the eyes of the audience was diminished. Here's how to fail at launching a franchise so badly that the franchise will be dead and buried before it's even on its feet. The first issue here is that the franchise elements are created on screen in such an insignificant way that that's exactly how they end up feeling for the audience. For example, how are the turtles themselves born into existence within the context of this movie? Are they a mystery we're trying to uncover until we finally lay eyes on them for the first time? Is their appearance somehow meaningful like how Bumblebee revealed himself by saving Sam and Michaela from a Decepticon? The turtle's existence here is born in the opening exposition dump that feels as exciting as it sounds. But I believe when that day comes and you rise to the streets, you are going to be responsible for a make- To give more context on the opposite end, look at the evil Foot Clan's creation. Do they get a meaningful introduction? Are they and their intentions a dark shadow looming over New York City that April is trying to expose and bring into light? Does their birth on the big screen feel significant like the first time we became aware of the Decepticons? <laughs> In addition to the Foot Clan also appearing in the opening exposition dump, so named because they step over the good people of this city. Everybody in the movie already knows about them and their actions. Which doesn't exactly sell them to the audience as a shadowy criminal organization. And as one more example for context, it's the same exact issue with April O'Neil. What's the way she's created here? Is it something significant like her as a reporter following leads to a dark spot where she finally lays eyes on the shadowy criminal organization she's been chasing for a long time? Nope, her birth in the movie is that she's bothering someone for a late statement, which is such mundane reporter work that literally anybody 
could do it. Sweetheart, you don't forget something like that. Oh, okay. Ten guys storm in here. These are restricted oh, okay. chemicals. Benzene yeah, yeah. cyanide yeah. Oh, okay. and some deaminating. And so the issue is that these franchise elements from the get-go seem so meaninglessly boring that it's very difficult to get into them. I mean, it's almost like the filmmakers just take the elements and toss them on screen like they're worth nothing more. The movie does do more with them later on, but as always, first impressions are everything. Possible. Yes, you amazing can. things. Just do it. And what could a significant version of the opening be? Well, instead of a boring exposition dump, what if you create everything in action by using April O'Neil's point of view? You know, maybe in the opening she's following a string of robberies that has led her to this port in the middle of the night, where she finally lays eyes on the shadowy organization that nobody else believes exists. She doesn't know their name, she still doesn't know what they're after, but she does now know they exist. And as she snaps proof, maybe she gets in trouble what was that noise? and she has to avoid detection and just before getting out she gets caught. The f you doing here? Now she thinks she's gonna die like all other witnesses in the past when boom, these four blurs suddenly appear to take the criminals on. She doesn't see them clearly because she's partly blindfolded or something but she can be sure that those four blurs are real. <laughs> From there, April continues to investigate the shadowy organization she now knows as the clan until eventually she begins finding clues about Shredder and she even finds the four blurs which turn out to be four Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I'm not saying this is the exact way to do it, but I am saying that in this manner, the central franchise elements need to be given birth to on screen in a way that makes them feel significant. Because if you don't do that, if you open the movie by just saying that, yeah, the, the turtles exist and the Foot Clan exists and the Shredder exists and they're doing all this bad stuff, that's not gonna sell them to anyone. The only way the audience can find those elements meaningful enough to get into on screen is if you create them as such. The second issue here is how the scenes that the franchise elements are used to build are so bare bones and average that it makes the whole thing feel uninspired and uninteresting. The April O'Neil port scene, for example, is so basic that it's basically just information. There's no challenge or tension or anything to make this scene stand on its own. No, April just goes in and before she's even there, the players already take the foot soldiers out to a point where they run out of there and then she just casually takes photos which is such a bummer to see because these franchise elements by definition have so much more to offer. You know, you can play into April's dedication as a reporter and have her sneak up close and avoid detection to get photos to expose the clan. You can play into the clan's danger by having them catch April and proceed to almost execute her like perhaps other witnesses in earlier robberies. You can play into the turtle's strength by having them show up just in time to fight the clan soldiers in an actual battle that we, like April, just don't clearly see. But instead, what we actually get here is like a basic story description of what's supposed to happen. Oh my god, bro. Oh. And this mentality of scenes playing out as their most basic description is how things usually go. When April meets the turtles for the first time, there's nothing there, no significant event it happens around, no special interesting way it happens. She just climbs up a ladder and takes a photo and then that's it, and then they talk. And with teenagers. Bye. <laughs> When the rich guy is revealed as the bad guy, it's not built through dread or anything. It's not like April's visiting him for help until she finds specific evidence incriminating him and then the whole scene is about her trying to act natural in the face of danger and try to leave before he realizes that she knows. No, we get a scene where she visits him and leaves without learning anything and then later on we get this separate scene informing us that, oh yeah, he's, he's a bad guy. <laughs> There's nothing in Shredder's first scene, he just beats up one foot soldier that we've seen the heroes beat up in rows before. There's nothing in April's taken scene, she gets invited to meet the turtles and then she gets invited to go with them and then she goes. I mean aside from a couple exceptions, there's nothing, apparently what this franchise has to offer in terms of building a movie is nothing. 
And when you have franchise elements at your disposal, you need to utilize them as much as the story allows to build scenes that are not only entertaining, but also special. In April's Taken scene, for example, use what you have. Maybe she comes home after realizing the truth about the rich guy and the Foot Clan, and she starts hearing noises and it's like, oh, they're coming for her. And just before she can escape, she gets caught and taken. But instead of the Foot Clan, by the Turtles, who she preferably now sees for the first time. <laughs> Now in the meeting and taken scene, she's freaking out and fearing for her life and sanity because it's not a usual thing for a woman to get kidnapped by four giant talking turtles. Point is, the only way to justify a franchise as a movie is to prove its unique specialty. The sequel did a much better job at embracing what the specific property has to offer and showcasing why it deserves to be a film, but unfortunately at that point the audience was way too disinterested to even give it a chance, thanks to this. Because, you know, a finale where five CGI creatures fight on an empty rooftop over poison that will destroy New York City, I feel like I've already seen that in multiple other movies. I don't need a Ninja Turtles movie for it. Something very familiar about all this. And if your Ninja Turtles movie makes the audience feel like they don't really need a Ninja Turtles movie because there's nothing special or interesting to do with it, then... Oops. The third issue here is how the franchise elements in this movie are treated with so little seriousness and dignity that they kinda just feel dumb. A great example of this is April O'Neil, who is presented as this super determined reporter, which of course, she's not. She's not following leads to find what she's looking for as much as she just conveniently ends up in the wrong places at the wrong time. What are you running from? Wait, wait, wait. She's not doing reporter work as much as she just takes pictures at idiotic moments without them ever even being used. She doesn't function like a human with a brain, but more so like a clown to be laughed at. Those are the vigilantes, and the vigilantes are these turtles. They were my childhood pets. <laughs> Get out. Overall, it gets to a point where you genuinely feel bad for Megan Fox, because she's basically there just to be objectified by both animals and humans, and to be a pretty face with a pretty, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's good! But a less obvious example of this is, for instance, the main theme built around the heroes. There are indications that the movie, above all, is about brotherhood and strength in unity, like with Raph not wanting to be a cog in a machine anymore. Coming out on my own, first chance I get. Which is great in theory, but hollow in practice. When Shredder attacks the turtle lair, they don't lose because Raph doesn't work as a team and instead goes solo. No, they lose because Leo tells Raph to go protect this area. Get to the fan room! Are you always telling me what to do? And he goes, and then meanwhile the others get taken by the bad guys. And it's like, that's not your theme. If you want to make this about brotherhood, then do that. Show that Rav has been secretly going off to fight on his own, and that he has real plans of leaving, and how it's an actual tough topic within the brothers. And then show how Rav now needs to fight on his own, which finally makes him realize the value in teamwork. You can't just say that the emotion comes from this thing without actually making the movie be about and reflect that thing. Now you're just a dumb children's cartoon. And every time I talked about walking away, it was because I was scared! I just didn't think I was good enough to stand next to you and call you brothers! What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Bro, I'm out, man. I mean, the villain side is so terrible that it's not good enough even for a children's cartoon. We have a super rich rich guy and a super powerful samurai guy. And what are their motivations for what they're doing? Well, I already told you. And I'm gonna be rich. Like, stupid rich. Right, so essentially, the villains are trying to get this cure for this poison that they already have, so that they can then release the poison over New York and se sell the cure to all the sick people. In other words, the rich guy wants to be rich and the powerful guy wants to be powerful. As to why they want to be something they already are, it's never explained, but I can guess. Why? Because f you give me money! And I think the main source behind this issue is that the movie wants to be like Dark Knight and therefore spends all its seriousness and dignity points in the wrong thing. See, around the midpoint, there's this never-ending exposition dump about the origin of the turtles, which is like, oh, the, the turtles were these test subjects in April O'Neil's past and then her scientist dad was killed by the bad guy and she carried the turtles and the rat into the sewer and then the rat grew in size and intelligence from the test mutation and he saw how New Yorkers would probably bully the turtles for being turtles 
turtles and therefore he taught them to be ninjas so that they can take care of themselves and survive in the human world and move on. And it's like, what? Out of all the things you needed to properly dignify, this is the one you went for. Like it genuinely reminds me of how in Transformers 4, the biggest development went into justifying why it was okay for the adult to be with the minor. This is illegal, she's a minor. We're protected by the Romeo and Juliet laws. We did for a little while, I was a sophomore and he was a senior, it's fine. No, it's not fine. We've got a pre-existing juvenile foundation relationship. Statute 2705 3 why not just make them both minors and instead spend that time on something that actually matters? How about you justify your villain motivations before trying to justify why the talking turtles are also ninjas? Like that's literally the one aspect that you're supposed to just embrace for what it is because it doesn't make any sense no matter the explanation. In general, just be mindful of which franchise elements you want the audience to take seriously, as well as the other franchise element pitfalls we talked about. Because even if you improve things in the sequel, it might not matter, because the first movie is the one audience saw, and now they're gone. But just to humor this movie, how could you actually in a serious way justify animals gaining intelligence? Well, instead of just saying that yeah, they were test subjects, you need to establish where that intelligence comes from, from the basics to more advanced levels. This is big brain time. If Leo understands logic and math, then show him doing fun interactive tasks about geometry and algebra and so on to learn it in a visually stimulating way. If Raph ultimately understands numbers and the strength in them, then show him learning statistics and probability and calculus. If Donnie knows computer science, then show him learning algorithms and data structuring and neural networks. If Mikey is savvy with social media, then show him learning how search engines and keywords function. I mean, that's what I did for my channel and look at me now. Yes, science. In other words, if you want your pets or yourself to learn in an easy way, just use Brilliant, this interactive platform that teaches you STEM subjects from the basics to a deeper level. Oh my god, bro. Uh, no, no, look, for real. If you want to gain intelligence in these areas for work or for personal growth, this is a hands-on, bite-sized way to do it in practice at home in your own time. No looking at formulas for hours in school. So if yes, check out Brilliant with 20% off for the first 200 people with the link below.